continuing on our mission of arising and walking in forgiveness. Everybody say the theme with me. Arise and walk in forgiveness. Say it with strength. Arise and walk in forgiveness. Now, so as we continue on this theme, as we continue on this theme, let us remind ourselves why it is important to reflect upon this theme. For me, the church consists of people, really people. And there are oftentimes broken people, people who have been through different crises in their lives, even before they came to the Lord. Many of us growing up in families can talk about the abuse. Maybe we never knew it as abuse growing up, but as we became older and we learned more, we can identify with the quality or the kind of abuse that we experienced as children growing up. Abuse by our siblings, abuse by parents, abuse by other family members and family friends. Oftentimes we talk about sexual abuse in families and sometimes that is the uh, big item we look about but there are also other kinds of abuse. Something as simple as a child not given the right education that they would need to take them through life. Many of us who are males will tell you that we live in the worst room of the house. Many of us will tell you as children that we live in the worst room of the house. There are four boys and one female. The one female live in the front room on a double bed, mirror. The four males live way down in the back room on a single bed, no mirror, nothing like that. And there are some persons who took our group and take that personal to be a kind of abuse. So I'm just making the point that those are the same people who come to the church and join the church and become members. Give me the other mic. Let me use this one, please. Excuse me, please. Amen. <laughs> You're better now, don't it? Yes. Right. So, so those are some of the issues that we grapple with even as we become members of the church. So becoming converted, going into the pool and becoming baptized, or even becoming filled with the Holy Spirit does not automatically heal us from some of those things that have formed our lives for 10, 15, 20 years. And some of us need therapy to fix those things. Amen. Because the truth is there are some of us who there is so much more to us that if we were able to identify and tap into our abilities and our strengths, we would be unstoppable. But the issues that bring to bear upon our lives, many of which we never had any uh, responsibility for, have deformed us. And that is a, that's a fact. People like Sister Avagay, Sister Miller, will tell you that some of the issues, no doubt, that they see in meeting people who are coming in for counseling are existing from many years ago. But even as an adult, they struggle with those things. And the truth is, if we should ask for a show of hand in this house today, how many of us are struggling with some childhood issues? If we are to be honest, I believe many hands could be raised. 
So although the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all our sins, we still struggle with some things in our lives. Say amen if you believe me. So these are the people who come to church. And then we come to church and we are seeking now to exist. I with my own baggages, you with your baggages, and we're all trying to exist in one space. And guess what's going to happen? We are going to clash. Amen? Your attitude is going to upset me, and my attitude is going to upset you, and we are going to have problems. That is why it is important that the church holds up in front of its members the doctrine or the teaching of forgiveness. Because our humanity is so pervasive that if we're not careful, we live by the dictates of the flesh rather than living by the dictate of the spirit. We have to be reminded that our humanity needs to be brought under subjection. Amen? So, today we're going to look briefly at the epistle, a part of the epistle to the Colossians written by Paul. And this epistle, of course, was written by Paul during his first captivity in Rome at about AD 62. The epistle was addressed to Christians of the city of Colossae and was delivered to them by Titius, whom the apostle had sent both to them and to the church at Ephesus. So when you talk about AD 62, you're looking at something that happened a long time ago. So what is the importance of that? To see how when Paul wrote to the church at Colossae about AD 62, the issues in the church are the same issues that we are grappling with today. Why? Because the issues that we're grappling with are issues within people. And people, AD 62, are people in the year 2022. Some differences in cultural um, changes and so on, but still human beings. Amen? Talk to me, man. Amen? So, of course, he wrote to them to inquire of their state, and to administer exhortation and comfort to them. The main objective of the epistle is to warn the Colossians against the spirit of semi-Judaistic and semi-Oriental philosophy. We don't now grapple with uh, semi-Judaistic or Oriental philosophies, but we grapple with an invasive world system that wants to make us act and believe and behave like they do. We grapple with that. So we too have to take the exhortation and the warning of the apostle seriously. Raise your hands and praise the Lord in this house. So he wanted them to recognize that these philosophies were corrupting the simplicity of their belief and was noticeably tending to obscure the eternal glory and dignity of Christ. So one of the things that I want us to understand is how offense can corrupt the simplicity of the gospel and it can obscure the eternal glory of the dignity of Christ. When we forgive, we are honoring God. Are you with me? When we forgive, we are honoring God. We're honoring God even when our flesh wants to hold vengeance. We decide in our minds that we're going to honor God by forgiving. When I was preparing the sermon, this thought came to me and I said I wouldn't share it with you, but I'm going to share it since it's come back to me now. I am not standing up here to tell you that forgiveness is easy. And I know some of you nice holy ones would say, oh yes, pastor, it's easy. But it's not easy because 
our flesh loves vengeance. Are you with me? Our flesh loves to see when somebody who offends us meet their Waterloo. We love to see when people are being affected by their actions towards us. So it requires discipline, everybody said discipline, to forgive. It requires discipline to forgive. But because we want to honor God, because we want to honor God, it's not, it's not so much, you know, Sister Banton Thomas, that I want to forgive, you know. Sometimes I would want to hold it because you know how you can feel nice in unforgiveness. But when you remember how it dishonors God, you realize that it is not something you want to hold in your heart. So I find the idea stated here regarding the simplicity of their belief to be an important point for our reflection. And brings me to the first part of the passage where he says, and here the emphasis is on the believers at the first part of the passage. The believer's relationship with Christ, that is. Paul tells the, the Colossians that if you were raised with Christ, you have your Bibles open, you should. If you were raised with Christ, he said you are to do what? Seek those things which are above. And he goes on to say, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. And then what he says here, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So when the apostle says that you, we died with Christ, he is emphasizing not that only did he die for us, which is called the sub substitutional death, but we died with him, meaning we identify in his death meaning that our fleshly life no longer dominates our actions we are dominated by the power of the holy spirit who comes to live inside of us we are not in the flesh but we are in the spirit in this regard christ not only died for sin bearing its penalty but he died unto sin, breaking its power. Because we are in Christ now, through the work of the Holy Spirit, we died with Christ. When you accept Christ in your heart, you tell him that I will do whatever you want me to do. I will have live how you want me to live. In the early service, Minister Bolton calls it the contract. You signed a contract with heaven to say, I will live by the decades of your word. We say it every Sunday after church, after reading, your words will I what? Hide in my heart that I will not sin against you. Amen. And when we come to Jesus, that's what we say. Hear what the Corinthians says. Paul says to the Corinthians in Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 12. For as the body is one and has many members, meaning your physical body, with your hands, your eyes, your feet, etc. But all the members of the body, being many, are one. In other words, I can't leave my hands at home. I can't leave my eyes at church. As much as there are some of you who would want to leave some parts of your body somewhere, maybe your nose, you can't. It's yours for life. Broad nose it might be, but it's yours. Not sure me talking. Mask covering up now, but soon I have the mask to cover it up. 
So, for by one spirit, we were all baptized into what? One body. Where Jews, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. So this is telling us that yes, this complex place we call church with all different kinds of personalities, all different kinds of attitudes and feelings and expectations, we are one. Everybody say that we are one. Yes, we are one. So in my physical body now, there are times, Minister Stone, when my teeth bite my tongue. Anybody have ever had that experience? Yes, man. Some of you, when you're chewing too fast, you bite your tongue. Do you discard your tongue? No, you don't. There are times when you might accidentally hit yourself in your eye with your hand. Do you discard your hand? No. What do you do? You, it is yours. You still love your tongue. You still love your hand even though it has caused some injury to another part of your body. Because what? The body is? Talk to me man. The body is? One. Amen. That's why I personally find it so hard even to conceive the idea of disfellowshipping members from the church because it is a very painful experience. This means that we can have victory over the old sinful nature that wants to control us because we are dead to sin and we live no longer under the dictates of sin. And each of us in the body must embrace our state in God. Amen, church. You must look at yourself and say, this thing about me needs to be corrected. I've been walking around with it for too long. Lift your hands and praise the Lord if you understand what I'm saying. In other words, you know that you have some attitude because your children tell you, your friends tell you, and you tell yourself. But because you have lived in that situation for so long, you think that there is no need to change even though it is wrong. And why is it wrong? Because it brings offense to your brothers and your sisters every time. It needs to be corrected. Amen? It needs to be corrected. You know, many years ago I had some friends and every time we meet up, they would say to me how terrible I am. They would say, you're terrible. And one time I used to take it for joke. But then, the more I heard them say it, is the more I begin to reflect on what they're saying. And I said, maybe I am very terrible. And what I do was not to begin to feel offended by what they say to me, but I use their criticism of my character or of my behavior, let me say to make adjustment. If you are at a place where people cannot tell you about your bad ways, you are in problems. Are you hearing me? If you are at a place where your friends or people cannot come up to you and say, I don't like your attitude, you are in problems because you will never ever correct some of those faults that you are brought into your new life. I've always said this, that when you are married, husband and wife, and listen to me, you must know when to tell your wife, say, you're wrong. Hello? 
and hus wives must know when to tell their husband that you're wrong you should not have done that if every time your husband come to you and tell you some horrible thing that he has done all you can laugh and say oh, 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 oh. And all the time is the same vice versa. You can just have fun about it. You have a problem in that marriage. Somebody must say, you should not have said that. You should not have done that. You are wrong for saying that or saying that. That's one of the objective of being married. You must correct one another's faults. Amen. I tell people every day, you know, if I want to do anything bad to anybody, I can't let my wife know. Because she will listen to me. In, listen. Good, good listen. And then I will hear something like, well, you think is that what the Lord wants you to do? So, so if I want to do anything, I have to hide it from her. And it's the same for her. I will listen to her. And I will say, well, Pat, I don't think you should do that. That's, that's, that's not right. We have to correct one another. Raise your hands and praise the Lord in this house. So within the new life, we are required to take actions towards accomplishing the standard of the new life. Everybody said the new life. This is why in verse 2, the apostle instructs the reader to set their mind on things above. Set their mind on things above. And here Paul is saying, habitually set your mind, your attention on the things above, not on things on the earth. Someone says that our feet must be on earth, but our minds must be in heaven. This is not to suggest, as D.L. Moody once said, that we are to be heavenly minded and, and no earthly good. It means that the practical everyday affairs of life get their direction from Christ in heaven. It means further that we look at earth from heaven's point of view. In other words, Sister Abigail, I see you as God sees you. Are you with me? Sister Spooner, I see you as God sees you. And let me tell you, God doesn't see us even like we see ourselves. God sees us as his prized possession. God sees us as important. God sees us as his precious jewels. That's how God sees us. And I know because I'm seated with Christ in heavenly places, must have that same view of my brothers and my sisters, the same eyes through which God is looking on my brothers and my sisters. I must look on them through those same eyes. Amen. So, Paul tells us to do two things. He said, we must put off, in fact, he said, put to death your members which are on the earth. So remember, he said, do not look on the earth. Don't set your affection on the earth, but set your affection where? And then he's telling us now some of the earthly conditions that we have to grapple with. And he said, put to death your members which are on the earth fornication uncleanness passion evil desire covetousness which is idolatry anger wrath malice blasphemy fill the language out of your mouth do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds in other words you shouldn't find yourself involved in these things that you are because you are now a new person in Christ. You put them to death. Amen, church? You put them where? To death. Now, all of us here at some points have had a loved one who died, right? Talk to me, man. You know, like when you can have conversation with me. Am I right? 
Now, don't you love you, the loved one who die? Yes, man. Or when they're dead, you love them same. As a matter of fact, some of you didn't love them while they were alive. You only love them when they die. Amen. <laughs> I have been to funerals. You know, I remember as a child, there's a vivid memory I have of a funeral. The funeral these days is not, not, not nice. And I said that, you know, you get what I mean. I don't mean funeral should be nice. But I'm saying the excitement of funeral these days is not there. Everybody now just dress up in dark glasses. But as children growing up, there was some excitement about funerals. Yes, it was sad and so on. But I remember this funeral I went to as a child. And there was this uh, woman there. And she was, we, we didn't know why she was crying so much. And she cried, and it was the dirt and mud, and they had to hold her. And she cried, and she, let me go, let me go, I want to go in the grave. And of course, the men, several men had to hold her to avoid her from going in the grave. So my young self now, teenager, in my mind, so why didn't I let her go? But then I let her go, make sure go in a grave. Because us as teenagers and children know, you know, that we want to see, you know, that the drama at the funeral, and we want to see it. And we're saying, let her go. Make sure go in a grave. And let us see, because in those days, it's not like now when they put a lot of, they don't put the, they, they put the, they dump up the grave with the dirt. So I don't know what would happen to her and the, grave, the dirt start coming inside of the grave. The point I'm making, though, is no matter how much we love our loved one, when they die, we part with them, don't it? We don't want them in the house. We don't want them in the house. Therefore, in your new life in Christ, you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. And the writer said you are to put away those things that are dead also. The Christian, therefore, should not have on their life. Amen, church. They should be put away because you are dead to those things. So it tells us what to put away. Put away. No, I don't want you to think that I think funerals are funny. It's a serious thing, but I'm just talking about some of the drama that you see sometimes. Then he says, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on. Everybody say put on. So there is the put off, or he said put to death, but there's also the what? Put on. He said, put on what? You have it in your Bibles? Put it up here for me, please. Do you know? Put it up here for me. Verse, what is this verse? Talk to me now, what's the verse? 10, 12? 12. Put verse 12 up there for me. I don't know if I can read that. It, so it says, um, you can read it? All right, let us, those who can read it, those with good eyesight, go ahead and read for those of us who don't have such good eyesight. What it says, verse 12, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on what? Set with strength, man. Tender mercies, what else? Kindness, what else? Go on. Bearing one another, and what? And what? He said, bearing one another. You know what that means? It means to put up with one another. It means not to be hostile towards one another. It means that if you see me with a little shortcomings, have some mercy on me. Don't be too hard on me. 
Somebody say, please be patient with me. God is not true with me yet. For when God gets true with me, what's going to happen? I shall come forth like what? Pure gold. Tell your neighbor, bear with me, man. What does it say? Oh, forgiving one another. What it says? If anyone does what? Have a complaint against another, even as Christ what? Forgave you, so you also must do. I will come back to the next part in a little while. But let me just, let's just look a little bit of how Christ forgave. So, people oftentimes ask, so what does forgiveness look like? Let me hasten to say to you that you don't necessarily forgive and forget. Because that's a problem many people grapple with. They say, well, I forgive, but I, you're going to remember. You're going to remember that someone has done you wrong. You're not going to forget. Your mind is not built like that. But you choose, even when you remember, not to remember with the hurt and the distress. And you choose not to treat the person who has offended you based upon what you are remembering that they did. You choose to treat them in the space of forgiveness. So let me say this. In Hebrews 10, verse 17 to 18, the writer states, Then he adds, Their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. God is speaking. And where these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. That is how Christ forgave us. When Christ forgives us our sins and our iniquities, he remembers no more. He wipes the slate clean. And then Paul says, what does Paul say? Let's go back and look at what he says. Forgive one another. How? Talk to me now. Even as Christ forgave you. You have to choose that even when you remember the hurt, not to hold it against the individual and to treat them as though it never happened. That is where many of us have a challenge. Remember why we do it. We do it to honor God. Amen? We do it not because we want to do it, but we do it because we want to honor God with our lives. Raise your hands and praise God. Because the Holy Spirit is bringing up in our minds the individuals, the people who we have slighted. You know, you may have heard this story, some of you. A friend of mine, many years ago, we had good friend, we are church, good friends, and all of a sudden, Sister Morgan, I am not speaking to the young man, he's not speaking to me. And I'm thinking, what is going on? And it goes on for a long time, so much that when I see him, I get upset, and I think he got upset when he saw me. And when I couldn't stand it anymore, I said, I have to find out what's going on. I went to him and I said, what have I done you? Why aren't you speaking to me? He said, I am asking myself the same thing. What have I done you? Why you are not speaking to me? I said, you haven't done me anything. He said, you haven't done me anything. So I said, why aren't we speaking to one another? And it was a big laugh. But do you see how the enemy could have mashed up a good relationship because of nothing? Somebody had to confront the situation so that it could be remedied. If you are finding yourself in a situation that needs confrontation in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and confront it. Do not sit down and pray about it and fast about it. You are wasting your time. There are some things that fasting won't fix. 
oh God, maybe I'm black. I hope, I hope I don't go over too far now. But there are some things that prayer won't fix. You have to get up out of your pride. You have to get up out of your self-righteousness. You have to get up out of that place. Arise out of that situation and go and make it right. Because that is what God wants you to do. I heard a pastor preach and said one time that this sister was at the altar pray, praying and shouting and, and going on. And he went down and said to her, what's the problem? What's the problem? Or what's going on? She said, oh, God wants me to repent. God wants me to repent. So if God wants you to repent, were you there the altar fight God for? You know, And you know how some of you women can go on at the altar, right? You know, he's if you hold some of you at the altar, you know. <laughs> you say, God wants me to repent. So if God wants us to repent, do you know that there are some of us who there is so much, and I said this before, but I'm closing now. There's, there's so much in us, so much greatness in us, if we would get out of this place where we find ourselves and begin to just let go and let God, if we would get out of this place where we find ourselves and let go and let God, we would see God doing some things in us that we would begin to wonder, is this me? Yes, it is you. But until you have decided that I'm no longer a slave to fear, I am a child of God, then some things will not begin to happen in your life. <laughs> Hallelujah! There are some of us who, because of our past situations, uh, Sister Minister Stone preached about this last week. We allow our past circumstances to hold us back. I don't want nobody to know about my life. I hear God saying to some of you, you need to testify about your mess so that others can know the good thing I have done in your life. I hear God saying you need to testify about your past so that people can know where you're coming from and see how good I have been to you. Because some of us come to church dressed up ourselves, looking all good, and everybody thinks we're coming from a good place. But some of us have come from a horrible place. And it is the grace of God, it's the goodness of God, it's the mercies of God why we can stand in this place and lift up our hands and somebody need to know about the goodness of God. Oh, hallelujah! Somebody need to know that this dress up person you see here didn't start like this. God has brought me from a mighty long way. There was a time when it was not like this. Oh, there was a time when I had no confidence in myself. I never had the self-confidence I had. I remember the first time I sang in church, one of the brothers laughed at me. He laughed at me. He made me feel so small. I said I would never sing again because he was a top singer in the church, you see. And he didn't want me to outshine him. So he made me feel so bad. I said I would never sing again. I still can't sing, but I don't have that problem. I'm not singing because, I, because of him. I'm not singing because I now believe I cannot sing. But there are some of you who can sing. There are some of you who can preach, but because of others. You have hung up your harps and say you will never play again. But I call you now out of that situation to rise up out of it and say nobody will cause me not to shine in God's business. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
I know there are some of you sitting right here today who God has given great talent but some of you are so intimidated because you said I can't dot my I's and cross my T's and you know when you sit down beside some of the members who come to church not to be blessed but to criticize everything how they criticize the pastor oh he didn't say that right oh he didn't say this right and you have sworn that you are not coming up here because you don't want to face your critics you have to shake them off shake them off are you with me don't allow your circumstances to prevent you from accomplishing what God has ordained for your life arise out of your brokenness and live in the power of God live in the power of forgiveness help me preach and tell your neighbor arise hallelujah hallelujah can I tell somebody that everybody has a past oh you don't hear me you don't hear me can I tell you that now let me tell you young people some of you young people some of you watching me online and you are there with your issues you are struggling with your issues and you don't know how to break out because you look at pastor Hedlam, you look at this you look at minister that and you say oh they're perfect I have news for you they're not your grace and mercy do I have anybody that will testify with me this morning your grace and mercy hallelujah have brought me through I'm living this moment because of you where is the church this morning I want to thank you and praise you too why for your grace and mercy hallelujah have brought me through if you have been brought through by the grace and mercy of Almighty God you need to stand up on your feet in his house this morning and let's bring the service to a close with a shout of praise in his house this morning if you know hallelujah that is your grace shout hallelujah 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 yes you have to struggle. Yes, you have your past. But don't abandon the grace and mercies of God. That is helping you and lifting you and encouraging you. Don't cause the gospel to be of no effect in your life. If God has forgiven you, it's nice to know that everybody around forgives you sister Miller but if God has forgiven you and you have forgiven yourself that that is sufficient don't live under the guise don't live under the judging eyes of others live under the grace and mercy of Almighty God are you with me church live under the mercy of God live under the grace of God live under the power of God live under the forgiveness of God it is about God it is about God you know I've heard people say all kinds of things about me and some of you hear some of them and some of you say some of them too But one thing I know, Sister Banton Thomas, when I go to my bed at night, I have peace because I have nobody in my heart. So I hope that people who might think that their words about me cause me to be up at night, it doesn't work. If I was to concern myself about the things that people say I would be a wreck I remember a member said to me one day after a convention he came and he said to me pastor what you do this person I said what you mean I don't even know the person he said 
you were walking in the convention and the person said you see him up there he has no behavior I said I don't even know the person I've never spoken to him why would he say that sometimes when people are jealous of what God is doing in your life they try to tear you down don't allow anybody to tear you down don't allow anybody to prevent you from what God has established in you hold up your head let God glory in you let God be pleased in you you can go ahead and open up the pool let God be magnified in your life there are some people who have come in your life to try to cover the glory of God in your life you must know who they are because they have come to remind you of your past but when you have de dealt with your past the only thing you have to look at now is your future if people want to go to the rubbish heap the dump heap of sin and find your past let them wallow in it but you don't wallow in it you have been forgiven you have been redeemed you have been set free live in that understanding don't allow people no matter who they are to make you feel bad about who you are you are a child of God let us sing that song your grace and mercy brought me through you can walk in your forgiveness because your grace God's grace then raise a hand and say your grace your grace your grace your grace Hallelujah. Me through. I'm living this moment. Yes. I'm living this moment. Because of you. Because of you. I want to thank you now. 
sing it one more time. But I want to give an opportunity for anyone today in this building who would want to give your life to Jesus. We're going to pray with you, but you need to just step right out here. If you are here and like to give your life to Jesus, step forward as we sing it just one more time. Then we're going to pray and go right into the baptism. The candidates need to get themselves ready. Baptizers, get yourselves ready. One more time. If you need to serve the Lord, if you want to give your life to Jesus, please step forward now. Your grace. Your grace and mercy. Brought me through. forgiveness we thank you Lord God that we can stand in this place of redemption knowing that you have redeemed us you have called us unto yourself oh Lord when we our sins were higher than a mountain the Lord you sanctify us our sins were flowing like a river but the Lord you sanctify us and we can say glory hallelujah for the fire came and sanctified us hallelujah lord help us to walk in forgiveness to forgive those who have trespassed against us and to forgive ourselves of those things that we have also done wrong in our bodies help us lord to walk in your grace recognizing that you lord god are honored when we forgive others and when we walk in forgiveness give us then the grace oh god to walk in forgiveness despite our feelings despite our hurt help us God to experience healing that comes from those hurts help us Lord to recognize that even though we will, we will remember the suffering that has caused uh, others have caused us not to remember it with a sense of hurt but to remember with peace knowing that we have forgiven we have been forgiven and we are living in unity as one body the body of Christ and so Lord I pray now that you will let your grace flow upon your people today those God were struggling there may be individuals God yes there are individuals who are today in the service and they are struggling with past situations that have battered their souls for a long time but I pray for the healing power of Jesus this morning to flow upon them that that which have the form, their character that has made some people miserable, made them too easily upset and caused them to experience such uh, deformity within their souls. I pray God that your healing power today, the balm of Gilead will fill them and your people shall be made whole in Jesus name. Bless your people today God. Lord, as we enter into this time of baptism, I thank you for your children who have come home to you. I thank you that, Lord, you are still saving, still forgiving sinners and still receiving them into your eternal kingdom. Oh God, I pray your blessing upon them and I pray your blessings upon the baptizers. I pray your blessing upon the even the water, God, and that this moment will be a time of great blessing, God. The Lord it will remember how when you were baptized at River Jordan, your father spoke from heaven and said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. I believe that today there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels for these who have come to you and I thank you, God, that there is rejoicing in this church also for those who have come to you. Oh, God, continue to save your people, I pray. And let your salvation be made available to those who are lost. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Let all the people say amen.